Restaurant Unstoppable, episode 673, with Patrick Mulvaney. With excitement, allow <laughs> me to introduce to you today's guest, Chef Patrick Mulvaney. My man, Patrick, are you feeling unstoppable today? I am unstoppable today. <laughs> Another beautiful <laughs> yes. day in paradise. Beautiful. So, Chef Patrick Mulvaney started his culinary career in 1985, apprenticing with renowned European chefs. Since then, he has worked in numerous restaurants throughout the country before settling in Sacramento, California, where he opened Mulvaney's B and L in 2006. In addition to leading the farm to fork movement in Sacramento, Mulvaney is a leading advocate for domestic violence, mental health, and suicide prevention. I cannot wait to dive into your story and discover the influence you've had on this community. But let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quarter mantra. What do you got for us? The mantra is that the most important thing to own in a restaurant is the attitude that allows you to ignore all the people who tell you no. Ooh, dive into that. Why does that resonate with you? Why did you choose that one? Because when you open a restaurant, right? I mean, well, look at you seen a little here, right? So just being in, no, you can't open a restaurant in a 120-year-old firehouse. No, you can't have an open kitchen. No, you can't have people sitting looking at your pantry or looking into your kitchen. No, you can't do over and over again, just the, the rules go yeah. on and on. I think of my friend Marcus opening a restaurant, and here's where I came up with this, was he was sitting in the corner, and it takes a long time to open restaurants, and, and he was with someone who I didn't know, but it was clearly a relative, who also clearly on her face showed the face of someone who was saying, my brother says he's op opening a restaurant, but we see very little evidence of that. <laughs> and, and I walked over and said to her, you know, here's the truth, right? Although you don't see much, it is happening. Yeah. Right? And I know your brother's going to be there. And the most important thing for you, Marcus, is to be able to ignore the people who tell you no. Yeah, I love that. It's a great way to get this started. It kind of reminds me of Danny Meyer in his book. He mentions who's, who says you can't. Right. Uh, there's like all these rules that like society, especially within the restaurant industry, makes like this is the standards, and having that mentality of of saying who knows who who says you can't, and having that that mentality of just not taking no and just kind of you know breaking all rules is kind of how you stand out, right? Mm -hmm. I love it. And how to make sure that <clears throat> that everyone that comes in feels welcome, right? Mm. So how do you how do you make sure that you're providing providing exceptional hospitality to people, right? So mm. that's what we say. We tell everyone when they start. Here's the deal. You come to Mulvaney's, the first word you hear is welcome, and that's the feeling we hope you leave with at the end of the meal. And in between those two spots, we're going to do everything we can to make that happen. Beautiful. Thank you for getting into that. And um, man, I'm really excited for this conversation because I've had the the privilege of speaking to some of the individuals you've mentored and helped get to the places they are today. Specifically, I'm talking to Brad uh, Checky, mm -hmm. uh, who had really great things to say about you as a mentor. You'd be really flattered uh, when that episode goes, <laughs> comes live. I'll be, I'll be sure to share it with you. Uh, so where does it start to make sense to, to share your story? When did you know that this was going to be your path or how did you get on this path in the first place? So in 1983, I graduated from college with a degree in English and that qualified me to be a waiter in Manhattan. <laughs> and uh, so I was working at Rosie O'Grady's in uh, in Midtown Manhattan, and realized that that a restaurant was what I wanted to do. And and I was also working out in in Rockaway Beach, out on the island where I'd grown up. And I remember one day my boss sitting on the patio, smoking cigars as he always did, and the mayor at that time, Ed Koch, walked in. I was doing a day bar shift, and he walked in, and I said, "Your Honor, how are you?" He said, "I'm here to see Tuberty." I said, "Yes, sir." And I go outside, and I said. Dan, Dan, the mayor's here to see you. He said, tell Ed I'll be in when I'm done with my fucking cigar. <laughs> and I thought, wow, what a great life, right? <laughs> you can, by having a restaurant, you are the center of community, right? Mm. So I'd already seen how much he helped the community in Rockaway Beach and helped the Irish ex expat community as well. But then also seeing that he was now a player where the mayor of New York City, who hated leaving Manhattan, actually spent an hour in a limo to come out to Rockaway Beach to see what was happening in the hinterlands. It's really interesting too because at one point, uh, if you go back in time, the the people who were the the inn owners or the restaurant owners were like the mayors. They were yep. big deals. I don't know at what point that we started to shift away from that, but I almost feel like it's starting to come back because you look at people like yourselves who are are these thought leaders who are kind of taking you know control of the community again, getting back in there, getting you know encouraging people to to be more human <laughs> you know right. like, the, like there's a re-emergence of humanity and i think it's it's the at the leading edge of that are restaurant owners would you agree and we see that right so the james beard foundation has a thing called um boot camps right yeah. where they bring 15 chefs together um to talk about public advocacy and they say why chefs and how chefs and what chefs um two weeks ago we just had 150 there's 300 alumni 
120, 150 of us gathered in Princeton to talk about what we were doing. But my favorite slide, I was back to talk about the Farm Bill with 15 chefs in upstate New York. And they do this every, every boot camp, did it in mind. They said, okay, we're here to talk about the Farm Bill. Text this. Everybody deserves sufficient, nutritious, tasty food. Good food, hashtag good food for good, hashtag chef's lead. And then you go out and you meet these 15 people you don't really know about. And, um, it was the weekend that Bourdain died, so we obviously had a lot to talk about. Mm. It was a great place to be. But the next morning start and say okay here we are welcome why are you here you're here because someone told you it was cool or we're james beard and we give awards and maybe this is a way for you to get more famous or something we don't know but we're here to tell you why you are powerful as a chef next slide here's my favorite slide of the day you tweeted this last night at 4 30 and when i made this slide at 7 30 this morning an hour ago 2.5 million people had looked at your tweet wow so you realize that all of a sudden that there's an audience out there yeah. and that people listen to you. Mm -hmm. And that even though in a restaurant sometimes we have a chip on our shoulder, right, that, that we think we're not good enough or, you know, my mother wanted me to be a doctor or my dad wanted me to be a lawyer, that, that we're really doing something good, right? That there is value in, uh, in bringing happiness to people and yeah. bringing people around the table. Well, you look at, and we're kind of getting a, a little off topic from your story, your mm -hmm. life story, but it's worth going into this. You look at humanity back to twenty thousand or 200,000 years ago, the, the beginning of the cognitive revolution. It was food, that the high-protein diet that helped transform us. And then 10,000 years ago, the agricultural revolution, where it was farming that helped transform society, right? And you, no matter where you look in human like history, like human civilization – Food is always like transforming us and leading the way, and I think it's starting to happen again. But and it's going to be in the form of restaurants, right? People, we've we've drifted away from what it is to be societal, and now we're starting to like we've lost. We're, I think we're coming back to it, uh, and the, at, like again, food's leading the way with restaurant owners. So like we have power, like you're saying, and it's what it's what you choose to do with it, right? The message you, you choose to deliver with that attention, which is really important. So when we opened we opened the restaurant uh, 13 years ago now and said. 24 seats, all wines available by the glass, menu on a chalkboard, total failure, right? I mean, we have the, the <laughs> banquet place next door. I can't read a chalkboard even if I wanted to. Um, so we're in a different space, but successfully. But my wife and I did not say was that what we had hoped for really was to create a place for people to come and talk about the issues of the day and potentially invite us into those conversations. Mm, I love it. So back to your story, and I, I'm really happy we went on that little tangent. But back to your story, you said that you, you, this is when you knew you wanted to open a restaurant. What was it about the industry that made you know this is what you wanted to do? That it made me feel home, mm. that it made me feel like I was part of family, and that it was a life where you were bringing pleasure to other people, mm -hmm. right? And it was pretty good. But what I saw was that the owners that I worked for, none of them knew how to cook. And every time the cook or chef walked out, they were kind of hosed, right, because <laughs> they didn't know – you, you didn't you didn't have access to that and that's why i thought if i knew how to cook a little i'd be better served when it came mm. time so i got an apprenticeship in ireland sean kinsler had been the executive chef of the P&O cruise lines and trained in the ritz in paris the Connaught in london firmly believed that uh all change in food stopped in 1933 with the death of augustus scoffier and um so he ran a hotel and and he certainly uh didn't like americans certainly didn't like me so when I went, he, he, I was represented as a qualified chef, right? My brother got me the job. And he said, is your man qualified? My brother said, qualified? Hell, he's a genius. He's got a degree in English. <laughs> Not knowing that qualified in a European kitchen means that you're qualified to run the brigade. And oh. that you've been in the kitchen for five years. So he was less than thrilled. First damn yank to come back since the potato famine. He's in my kitchen. <laughs> uh, so I got fired nine times in six months. But, but when I came back to America, there was two things. One, four weeks in, I said, I'm not going to let this little short fuck beat me and made the conscious decision to start learning what I was really there for. I really dove in as hard as I could to figure out how to run a kitchen, mostly at that time for survival, to not get yelled at. And then, but when I came back to America, it turned out I was a cook. You were fired nine times, you said? Oh, yeah. yeah. How, what was going on that you were allowed back every Green time? pants and blue sneakers, <laughs> and uh, one night he thought he had his niece in, the, in my room, and yeah, it would, and, and every night... So it, in the beginning, I would take it seriously, and I would start to go out. And one night, one night he uh, fired me for something again, like a, something stupid. I don't know what it was. Um, and he, I came up to the kitchen. I was getting my knives and saying, he said, where the fuck do you think you're going? I said, well, <laughs> sir, you asked me to leave your hotel last night and stop breaking your heart. <laughs> it's pissing rain. Where are you going? I was like, well, I was going to catch a ride with Joey up to Trulie, and then once I get to Trulie, I'll hitch over to 
cork and spend some time with some friends, and then my money runs out, I'll go back to New York. Go put your stripes on before I kick you in the ass. <laughs> I said, oh, he loves me. He loves me. It was my Sally Field moment, right? <laughs> he really loves me. And But, you know, and it was that it was that piece. One, uh, was so I was 23, so it was uh, the people that were working with me there, commies who were on my level were 16 and 17, right? High school juniors and seniors. So I was I was behind in that, and I realized I was behind in education. So really, my cooking education started with me always thinking about being behind. Okay, so um, I'm curious. Uh, would you say he's one of your your key mentors, one mm-hmm. of the people that would fall on that? Like, what were the, the biggest lessons you learned from this individual? <laughs> How to get yelled at really well. Right? <laughs> For the first one of the first nights, he uh, there were some folks in from America. I think it was either Jeb or George Bush was over playing golf, and um, he wanted to make baked Alaska for them. And I, they said, make meringue, and I thought I knew how to make meringue, and I did not know how to make meringue. And uh, so he came down with a twenty quart Hobart with not meringue and threw it across the kitchen at me and spilled over. And he was just yelling up at me as everyone, all the other cooks were sitting there cracking eggs and laughing at me until he turned around and they were very busy and then turning around <laughs> and going back um so that was where i learned learned that it matters what's inside you mm-hmm. right not not what someone else says about you listen to what they say and then use that to to give yourself guideposts to so get better what, what was inside you at this time what was the thing that helped you push forward so then i started and said okay well how does this how's the fucking kitchen work right and and what do I do, right? So I knew that his his cutting boards from his trips on the boats were um, eighteen by thirty six inch pieces of teak, one one piece of wood on all the boards. And one night I didn't oil them, and he freaked out, right? As he, as he should, as I would today, knowing how valuable they are. I said, okay, that's important to him. And then I started to think, why is that important to him? What can I do? And so what I really was doing mostly in, was working in the bowels of the kitchen. So I was receiving, eventually I was ordering, I was doing all the butchery, right? But I learned that piece by piece to say, what is it that gets us, what is it that I can do here to make the life of the boys and girls on the line easier, mm. right? And that became that became the, the through piece. So by the end of the summer, although he wasn't pleasant with me, he was uh, yelling at me a lot less. So there's a couple of things that came out of that story. The first thing I want to highlight way back when we first started talking um, was that you knew that you didn't want to be dependent. If you ever opened a restaurant, you don't want to be, be dependent on a cook or a chef or a, mm-hmm. a person. If you're going to be a, a successful restaurant owner, you need to know how every you need to be able to jump into any position that your restaurant has because. You, you have to be system dependent and dependent on yourself because if you're dependent on somebody else and they go then what you know I think that's a big lesson that we can draw from your story and then they, I think the other big thing which you just dropped on us is the idea that you exist to serve others and when you can think about how can I make other people's lives easier that's how you create opportunities for us, yourself that's how you get recognized and that's how you I mean when you have that mentality, mentality as an owner that, that that's servant leadership right there that's your right. job is to make sure everyone else can do their jobs right do you want to dive into that a little more and how do you make it better for so how do you make it better for everyone else? Certainly for the diners, how do we make that more comfortable? Um, so last week, a drain broke in the kegerator next door. And a bunch of people said, what do we do? It's broken. It's broken. There's nothing we can do. Call a plumber. Call a... And I brought over the maintenance guy and said, okay, here we go. Here's a tube. You're going to pull this piece of plastic out. We're going to get some Gorilla Glue. You're going to jam that on. You're going to come back in an hour. I don't know whether this is going to work or not, but if it does, that's great because it's going to save us 100 <laughs> bucks, right? And so so now Jonathan knows. He's re- he's empowered to fix things. He also knows something new that he didn't yeah. know before, and I saved 100 bucks. Yeah. But it's that idea of how do you teach people stuff, right? So we tell people, so our menu changes every day, right? It's a challenging restaurant to work in for sure if you're a cook because it, you never know what's going to come in. depends on what's coming in the front door challenging on everybody the service having to rem- learn a new menu every day too but you can but if you're a cook here you learn a ton right and so and the truth is and anything you want to learn you can learn here you want to learn about dutch cuisine fine we'll put potatoes on the menu right that's good for the waiters and i didn't think about this right i think about it from me because i'm kind of adhd and so for me i'm served well by changing all the time and thinking about new things and being able to put new ideas on the menu right away so our cooks that stay are engaged right because they're working what I didn't think about was that our servers then are engaged too because things always change. So say you worked on Tuesday and now you're coming back on Friday, you had a couple of days off. 
you see the waiter saying, hey, what's new? Hey, chef just got these mulberry beauty potatoes came in from, they sent potatoes by mail. I don't know where they came from, but they're using them on these beautiful gnocchi with the squash. And it's really cool because Nina brought in persimmons that he put on top, a little astringent, but just a slight sweetness with the brown butter. So the, so the waiters are vested in what's in the menu. And then that goes over to the, to the tables, right? So when you're at the tables and people say, tell me about the menu, then they're telling the stories, right? And mm-hmm. it's that, for me, it's the, at this point, I'm, I'm a teacher and a storyteller, right? And it, and it really is about the story, right? Yeah, but I mean, I think you, you know, it's, you bring, you're giving great lessons in just the power of keeping your people engaged and keeping it fresh and, mm-hmm. and keeping them drawn in. Because if things get old and stale, then, you know, you're gonna you're gonna lose that you're gonna lose that uh what's the word just the, the their attention they're, they're they're gonna go seek it someplace else right and how do you make it so that so we've been thinking a lot lately or i guess i've been thinking about it always in terms of cooks but lately we've been thinking about it and everyone in the organization um how do you make this a fulfilling life right so when i got back from europe and i was working for leslie revson she was the first female chef at the waldorf astoria and uh totally anti-french so i went from from Escoffier only to fuck the French in terms of our food. And my mom came in for lunch or dinner with Leslie, and she went out and said, Mrs. Mulvaney, it's nice to meet you. We love having Patrick in the kitchen. He's not a very good cook, but he's pleasant (laughs) enough, right? Um, And I remember the quote because my mom repeated it to me frequently. My parents were not in favor of me being a cook in 1985. And Leslie said, and and my mother said, he's going to go back to school. He'll be a doctor or a lawyer. And my mother sa- and Leslie said to my mother, Eileen, I have a degree in, from art in McAllister College, and every day I get to do what I love with my heart and my hands and my head. And what more can we want for our children than that they should lead a fulfilled life like that? Ooh. And in that time, and I remember the quote because my mother repeated it frequently over the years, my mother flipped 180 degrees. That's awesome. Yep. So, so what else did we learn from Leslie? And this is kind of what I like to do with the show is to, to hover over the mentors you've had in your, mm-hmm. in your life. Uh, I mean, that's a great lesson, just ha- being fulfilled in the work you do. But what else did she teach you? So the first most important thing that I remember from Leslie Revson is the tasting, right? Before your before uh, service started, as she came through every day to taste everything. And and that she would, you would move. We aimed, we had a joke on the line, is that if Leslie tasted sauces and said, needs four grains of salt, then that meant perfect, Right. And if we had actually put in those four grains of salt that Leslie would say to us, watch the salt. <laughs> <laughs> so it's that, it's that idea that you're constantly tasting and thinking and refurbishing and saying how, how do you make sure that everything is the same as much as you can? How do you make sure that everything tastes good as much as you can? Yeah, and it's just like, like you track your numbers, right? You need to, to, to track your numbers so you can see uh, deviation. You need to track the, the, the way things are coming out of the kitchen to make sure that that, that standard is there every time mm-hmm. so it's coming out of the kitchen consistently, right? Um, what else does she teach you? I think uh, uh, one of the other things to think about it, that I learned from, learned from Leslie was her reticence of going out on the floor, right? So this is a long time ago, right? There was no... MTV. There wasn't. There wasn't uh, cable TV even in New York City. Um, that she hated going to the tables, and she hated talking to people. But because of because of working for Dan Tuberty and Sean Kinsel, I saw the value of everyone loves to talk to the chef, right? And everybody wants to talk to you. And so I saw that from her as kind of a shortfall, right? I mean, she was a great chef. Her food was really good. We all loved her. People were loyal to her. But she wasn't as successful as she could have been because she wasn't willing to talk to the public sometimes, mm. right? And so I think that the outreach and sharing, sharing your story becomes something that's very important. You know, so here, we'll wait. And I'll tell, you know, because we have the open kitchen, people lean in. Hey, dude, nice steak. Hey, love that pasta. That was killer. You know, people come over and pull the mozzarella with the pantry guy. So they have interaction. Sometimes the, when I see them not wanting to talk to people i'll wait so say you come in and you're my friend you order sweetbreads and i'll just come out to you and say i'm going to send the grill cook out who made your sweetbreads bust his balls just a little and don't tell him right and then because he wants to know and i'll go back in the kitchen and say table 12 wants to see you what what about (laughs) no idea dude but he does not look happy you know just got to i'm not going out there yes you are yeah he wants to talk to the guy that made the fucking sweetbreads out there you go and then go out and say, uh, hello, um, did you make the sweetbreads? Yes. What, how'd you do them? I'll explain it. 
still nervous and say, they were brilliant. Good. Go back. <laughs> right? And so then we start and we teach people, right, that the, that the idea is that people want to know who you are, right? Yeah. That what we're doing every day is putting our personality and our love on the plate. And, and it's important to be able to do that table side too. And so we do that by sending people out to the table and say, here's what you do. And, and it, until you get better at it, just follow these three steps. How do you do my name is, how is everything tonight? Small, small amusing anecdote and say goodbye, right? Yeah. And it's so important to, I think, especially as we progress into the future, uh, younger people are getting less equipped to be able to handle those social situations. And it's important as a leader to remind people of the, the value. I mean, we've gotten lost on our devices, right? We're not great. We can't even answer the phone. We don't know how to talk to people on the phone anymore. And it's, it's important to, to force people into those awkward situations so they get used to handling them. Because someday when they, do, they own their own place, they're going to have to have those those soft skills, right? But even when we started, you know, in the early 2000s, with, and most of us had cell phones, but not all of us for sure. But I would, as I started reaching out into the civic community, They'd make fun of me, you know, a chef's got a jacket on, he's networking, ha, ha, ha. But the truth is then we'd come back from our parties, pull the truck up and unload everything, and Kevin's inside washing dishes all night. We'd sit on the back of the truck and crack open some beers, and people would start coming up riding over because they knew we were there, right? And so there'd just be people in the parking lot talking about, does Biba need new cooks? Hey, how's this guy doing? I saw this guy was drinking too much. Is he getting better? Is that guy getting worse? Where are we at? And, and I would then stand up and laugh at them and say ha ha you're networking right <laughs> maybe wearing t-shirts and dirty pants but you're still networking just the same yeah. and that networking is what's important right because it's through the community that we keep ourselves strong and move our society forward i love it so important so identify i, I identified at least two other restaurants that you, uh -huh. you worked at that you that seem to have a big impact on you but i don't want to make assumptions yep. so real quick just list if you can think of, of the two or three restaurants additionally that you've worked at that you think most transformed who you are today, and then we'll start to di di uh, dissect how they transformed you. So I think about, right, starting with Kinsler, right? Escoffier, Leslie, not French specifically. Mm -hmm. The next one that I went to was the River Cafe, yes. Dave Burke, son of, a, son of a subway driver who was disowned practically when he got uh, a scholarship to go to CIA because his dad said, no son of mine is ever going to be a cook. Mm and then to see his success. But but walking in to that restaurant, that had a couple other stages in places that were a little more formal, and walking into some place where there was just hell breaking loose, right? <laughs> and there was shit going on, and people were screaming at each other, and the the uh, all the all the uh, prep guys were Haitian, so you ha had to learn French to communicate with them. And, and instead of that rigid place where I was okay and I could see where I could learn to be in this space where it was crazy, was a cool opportunity and I could tell that I felt right at home. And the other thing there, in terms of having to push hard, is that when I went into the River Cafe, I was the only person in the kitchen on the hotline who had not been to the CIA. And so there was a lot, there was a lot of people who would say, why do I have to listen to him? Why do I have to listen? He didn't go to CIA, you don't have any schooling. But because I was, by that time, you know, three or four years in, I was, I was getting to be a good cook. And Dave would just say, because he's smarter than you, right? <laughs> and pay attention. And so that was really that was really good. And then we moved to Arizona and and leaving New York, which was super exciting, right? So for Dave to send me over to Chanterelle and Dave Waltuck saying, you know, hey, thanks for coming in. I understand you had to give up your Yankees tickets today. Here I got a boxes for uh Red Sox, Yankees in September, and Dave already wow. says you got the night off. I'm like, this is fucking great. Yeah. <laughs> but we moved to Arizona. No, I had no idea where I was going, right? At the time, I had to, in order to find out anything about food in Arizona, I had to take a train, take the subway into uh, Times Square. It's only three stops from where we were living. And go to the international newspaper stand and buy the Sunday Phoenix paper to see who was, who was the food writer, what the restaurant yeah. scene was like, and had to send letters physically out to see where I was going. But I got there, and I landed at Roxanne. And Roxanne was... Uh, she had Spanish and Italian parents. Her husband was Greek. Her first sous chef in her restaurant that she had in Honolulu was from the Philippines, and we lived in the desert. So we went from New York, which can be kind of regimented and self-sure of itself, right, in the center of the universe, and this is the way food should be, to a place where we're in the desert. What do we got? Let's go. Let's mash it all up. And for those five years, that was just a great learning experience. Seems to be like forcing creativity, right, to, to work with what you got. To every day, right? Yeah. And so it was... It was 
and I think about it now, right, that Ireland really was um, was really farm to fork, right, because we were so far out in the country that what came in the back door really w- literally was what came off the truck yeah. or the fishermen coming in and saying, Yank, I've got a salmon, do you want that? And to be in Arizona kind of limited, limited that, right, because not much grows in the desert. No. But then as we as we went on, right, in order to, so I, got, I went to the School for American Chefs with Madeline Kamen, so it was four chefs every two weeks creating your own curriculum. And part of it was to create a menu. And I created, and my menu was a pre-Columbian dinner, right? So just all food that was there in the desert before the Westerners came. Okay. Who, back at Roxanne, mm-hmm. who was the, the person that influenced you the most there? Who was the, the leader? Roxanne Skokos. Rock, and okay. so she was the chef there. Okay, cool. Thank and you. I wasn't sure if that was the name of the restaurant mm-hmm. or the person. Thank you. So let's dissect this a little bit more. Let's mm-hmm. go back to David Burke. Um, you mentioned a few things about how he was, but really dissect who he was and what he taught you about how to present yourself and how to lead a team. Because for a little context, uh, David Burke and River Cafe is is one of those restaurants. If you want to learn more about the backstory of this restaurant, uh, they do a pretty good job profiling it in um, Chef's Drugs and Rock and Roll, mm-hmm. I think is the name of the book by, um, uh, help me out with his name. Um, Freeman. Freeman, Andrew Freeman. Thank you. Uh, really so many amazing people have come through that restaurant and go, gone on, and you're an example of that, to go do things across the nation. This guy's been cranking out professionals the entire time he was open. So what did he teach you about what it, what it takes to be successful? Well, I think that the the longevity of the of the river comes from Buzzy O'Keefe, the owner, and his brilliance in hiring Larry Forgione first, and when Larry was ready to go out and open an American place that Charles Palmer came in. And then I came on when Charles came uh, – all the boys and girls that were working for him expected it was spring. And they said, oh, we're going to go out to the East End and sleep on the beach. And then Oriole is going to open in September. And so Dave was kind of hosed. And I came in at a, at a time when he was just building his team back together. Yeah. And um, so, but it's not only those three guys, right? It's the other people here. Tavel, Tavel who has um, Emmer and Rye in, in Austin and just all sorts of people, right, who, who have gone on from – this crucible of a super busy restaurant and always having that demand for creativity and pushing yourself, right? So being pushed and then, and I guess there what I really learned was that you push yourself to do what is in your task in front of you so that you can satisfy your own creativity, right? So in other words, you get ready to make everything good to satisfy the customer. And then if you're smart, you figured out how to give yourself 20, 30 minutes to fuck around with something, mm. right? Like, hey, I just read Marcella Hazan stuffs peaches with pastry cream and then deep fries them, right? Like, how, how does that work? I have no idea, right? But I gave myself that time. And at first, I was, when Dave came out and saw us frying peaches, he's like, what the fuck are you doing? I'm like, oh, I just saw this. He's like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe we'll do it this way, right? Yeah. And then it became, instead of, so what I thought was first I got caught as a kid in the candy jar. But what what Dave said to us, and that what that's what's important is, no, you should be you should be putting your hand in the candy jar, but just make sure that you've done all your homework first, right? Yeah. So as long as you're ready, then I want you to be out there and reaching. So w- what was about the culture that he established that it, it was good to push yourself? How did he create that culture where people felt like they're they they had that room to do that? Well, I think that everybody was pushed all the time, right? I think yeah. the first three three months, I told people that the only word I heard was push, 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 okay. hurry up, like literally. But yeah. still, but but there was so so you were focused on what your task at hand, but there was so much else going on, right? There was, you know, Pete the butcher, and all the first time I'd seen charcuterie and learning how to make mortadellas and emulsified sausages and smoking things, right? The first time that I had seen like how a big smoker works, and then to have a place where you're smoking with cinnamon for your quail, where you're taking rosemary and putting that on your chicken, where you're seeing the pastry chef do all these other things, and everybody just pushing and running so hard, right? So, and the and the first the first and it was tough, right? It's not an easy kitchen, right? But it was it was because we want to be the best we can, right? And and how do we how do we do stuff? And when shit is fucked up not to worry about it but to say yes that's bad what do we do next so we were doing fourth of july on a yacht in new york harbor for three three days and uh we had a big big uh mirror six foot mirror with uh appetizers on it like big appetizers small serious potatoes just hard work that we'd all put hours and hours in and we put ed 
our best wager in an elevator. So in a boat, elevators don't have doors. So Ed was crouching under the mirror to hold it up. And then we ran up the stairs. I'm standing there with Dave. Press the button. The elevator starts moving. And then you hear, shit, shit, shit. And then you hear, crack, crack, splash. Oh. <laughs> and the elevator opens. And there is just shit everywhere. And poor Ed just thought, like, his world had ended, right? Because he'd let us down. Oh. And Dave looked at it and said, all right, how do, you much, how much do you have left? What's next? Let's go, right? And back down we went and said, what do we have? We need to fill up this much space. How much stuff do you have left? And we started again to build it up. And next time we brought it up through the stairs instead of the elevator. What's the lesson there? The lesson is that that sucks, but show must go on. Yeah, right? you, and can't, that's it. you can't let Let's it get you rolling, down. Right? Because, I mean, it happened. What are you going to do about it? And Move so, on, right? And that's you, all you can do. And you just move on as best you can, again, with that idea to how how everything else was working, right? So yeah. I think from Dave, what I learned, so that day too, because there were some folks that were prima donnas, right, that, that were, that were kind of douchey, just like, I guess, anywhere. And um, so we'd been up all day. I was running. I'd already replaced this. We were doing stuff. And at one point, I was carrying stuff out to a guy that was on a carving station. He was prim and proper and had his little... Uh, CIA neckerchief on and his show coat was all clean and I, I am not the cleanest guy and so I might have been a little disheveled <laughs> and he looks at me and he says dude you're a mess you have to clean yourself up and I just said fuck you and I turned <laughs> as I turned around I was staring into Malcolm Forbes face who looked at me and said how you doing I said uh, good sorry boom <laughs> back downstairs we go right but it was that idea that here's what's important right let's make sure that all these people on this boat or having a good time. Yeah, I love it. Great stuff. So, um, moving on, Roxanne, same thing. What, what was it about her? So before uh, we leave the River Cafe, yeah, so people always ask, like, what's my favorite meal? And so what I tell them is the night I left, in typical River Cafe fashion, I was forced to work a double, right? After going out drinking the night before and coming back, I was getting on a plane to go to Arizona the next day. And that night... Um, Everybody came in the kitchen, but all five stations, right, all of the brigade made uh, dinner. And so everybody, each station, those guys all made buffet for us. Uh, Eric, the pastry chef, made a 24-inch chocolate wow. uh, Statue of Liberty holding a cactus oh, cool. to say goodbye. And so we all filled up our plates and walked around. At that time, walked out of the kitchen and around the corner and sat on the quay on the, the uh, shore of the East River with our feet hanging over the river eating food, looking at the lower skyline of Manhattan as Dave and Johnny and Rick brought out beers and wine for us to drink over there. Yeah. Um, you know, what's so, that, so that lesson that's important is that's a place where Dave said, thank you, good and faithful servant. And it's, mm. the, it's important, the value to say at the end of the day, we place importance in you. Thank you for your work with us. Yeah, and the, the, the power of that recognition, too. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really important, uh, which is a kind of like an underlying lesson here, is that this was the most memorable meal for you. But it's not necessarily the food that stuck with you. It's how right. you felt. Right. And I think you know, when we get so caught up in about the food in this industry, and don't get me wrong, food is important. Mm -hmm. But how you make people feel is what will make them remember you. And never forgetting that, too, right? And to go from a place where, you know, when I started, people were like, why the fuck do I have to listen to him? Who is he? Who's this douchebag that doesn't have a, a toolbox and he didn't go to CIA? Two, them all, one, coming back to go out to dinner and drinks and all that stuff afterwards, but also taking the time to make a banging meal Yeah, uh, as I was leaving. And the power of a last impression, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we, we can... We can keep that in mind, even with our when our guests are going out the door. Like, are they just walking out the door, or are you, you know, thanking them one last time? Are you are you going that extra mile to, to leave that last impression before they walk out? Because that's how you're going to be remembered. That last impression. And so here we play at the B and L. We play the Rockaway game. We call it, and that's um, this, I'm not always good at names. Who's on forty two? Where did they come from? Who are they from? And it comes from Rockaway Beach, where you say, "Hey, I was out with Patty last night." Oh, Patty from. 88th? No, no, Patty from 102. Oh, with the sister named Louise? No, not Patty with the sister named Louise, the one three blocks down who has a sister named Jezebel who rides a bicycle and is going to Long Island University, right? And so so as we play that game here, who are those people? Hey, you know what? That's, that's uh, This guy is an animal doctor or this is a veterinarian or this is my neighbor or that guy works at Ella or at Cannon. And so it makes it so that our whole staff wants to know who our customers are and who the clients are 
and brings the family in tighter. Beautiful. I love it. So do exactly what you did describing Dave Burke and your experience at, at River Cafe with, with how Roxanne was and the, the lessons you learned there about how to be and who to be. And so we got to Roxanne. And uh, so like I said, all of a sudden it was this huge explosion, right, of, of Arizona with um, – lots of people coming in from the outside world right in new york the the clientele was all new yorkers so it was interesting obviously super busy in the winter and uh not so busy in the summer but that idea that what roxanne wanted to do was say what is food does it taste good and we can define it however we want right we don't have to be because you left remember i come back to new york at a time when all the best restaurants are french right and and those guys were retiring they were all come for the uh, World's Fair in 1939, and except for uh, Soltner at Lutece, and Seppi Rang- Soltner was French, and Seppi Rangley, who was Swiss, was at the Four Seasons, but every other top restaurant in New York during my childhood was French, right? And then Larry Forgione comes, and then Jonathan Waxman comes from here in California, which it, we viewed as a foreign country, <laughs> and Von Gerichten comes back, and instead of having sauces just made with stocks, there were oils and vegetable orders, and, and Leslie saying, screw the French, this is all going to be a different way. And so there was this huge implosion. When I came back to America, there was uh, Prudhomme had what they call what we would call a pop up now. I don't know what we called it then, but three blocks down, while he was refurbishing, he had three months of K. Paul's Kitchen in Manhattan. We walked in and said, "You're making roux with oil and not butter. What is a redfish? You're you're burning that shit. What's what's blackened rice? Right? What's blackened fish? What's dirty rice? All these things. There was this great explosion. But still, New York was kind of regulated, and then you leave this world of New York and go to Arizona and it, it's a desert, right? Yeah. It really, you get to, it was a, it was a blank uh, canvas with, with Roxanne as an artist saying, how do we want to create our own canvas here and what are we doing? And she was a brilliant pastry chef too. Um, so always the eye on, on the presentation and what things were going to look like, but the idea that you could mix things, right? So to come and say, it's Christmas, right? And in, and it's time for the tamalada. Okay, so but we're not a Mexican restaurant specifically, so what else can we do? Well, let's take lamb and make curried lamb and use uh, rice and make a rice tamale instead, right? And let's put some satay sauce with it, right? So we're going to take things that are Indian and Indonesian and put them all together in a mashup. Let's take, I love lamb chops, right? Okay, so let's do a little baba ganoush right but let's make our own homemade tortillas right so that you can pick up the mongolian lamb chops yeah. with baba ganoush and tortillas and mix them all together and see whether they work and so for the five years that i was there that was that was our task right that was that was our our way forward yeah was because the challenge in cooking and by that point i've been cooking five or six years right so it was easier for kids for the young people who are coming in when you say because the menu changes all the time i want you to create something I know that if I say just create something, here's the food, that they're going to have a hard time because that's too many options. And so we'll, what we'll do then is start and say, what do you want to know? You want to know about Italian food? Okay, here's Marcella Hazan, right? And then here's squashes right now, right? Here's what's coming in from the field. I want you to tell me what you think. And then let them come back to you with the ideas and then have the conversation back with them. Hey, this is good, except for let's look at how we move that closer. So at Roxanne, it was really, I felt like a partnership with her, right, as we began to to build up this cool stuff at the same time that American cuisine was blowing up all over yeah. the country. The, the big thing is I'm pulling from this part of your life, the story, is that she really taught you um, the power of creativity, but also bringing you all in and not letting her in. She didn't let herself influence you. She wanted mm-hmm. you to... to spark ideas spark creativity and then she opened up the the the, pa- the pathway to let you f- give her feedback so it was a group effort and tapping into that potential right and not letting your opinions influence other people's opinions but really giving them that 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 boundless uh opportunity to give feedback before you influence their opinion right right and um, what, what what was coming out of the kitchen right and what does it look like I mean, there's so much power in that. We in, we we have so much limitless pl- power at our disposal within with, within each person that's on our team has like boundless creativity and and tap into that and and it's compound that that energy with your own and don't be so you know leave yourself open to the possibilities is what I'm pulling from that, for that part of the story and in a way and how to do it in a way that's functional yeah because if you just say to someone go forth and multiply 
then that's that's not always the most effective because you need to be a little directional, mm-hmm. but leave leave some sense of uh, ownership in, and, that, and, in but, that direction. Yeah, and uh, when you can let your people influence the end product, they're they're going to have that, that sense of ownership and they're going to be more proud of it, right? Mm-hmm. They're going to have it's going to have a little bit more weight and a little more impact. Would, yep. would you say? Mm-hmm. So, anything else that's worth covering at this time of your life before moving? Because it was after. Phoenix, or after Arizona, you made your way out to Sacramento, correct? So Phoenix was fun and super engaging and great, but it was not as exciting as Manhattan to cook in for sure. And the woman I had moved down to Arizona with is an anthropologist. And so I started to look back at school at ASU to say, what's going on? And I came up to go to school at American Chefs with Madeline Kamen and, and asking all these questions about food and history and science and the end of the two weeks, she said, you ask too many questions, go to UC Davis. They can answer your questions. So Davis said, absolutely. We have one of the premier food science programs in America. It's very nice. You have a degree in English. We read poetry at Christmas, too. But this is a real school, and if you <laughs> want to come here, you'll need 35 hours of chemistry. So I went back to ASU and got a second bachelor's in chemistry to apply for grad school here. And so that was my drive to come up to uh, California. We're back, and um, we were just talking about how you were transitioning out of Arizona, uh, focusing on cult, like your education. Take it from there. So it was partly maybe a seven or ten year itch of cooking, right? Was this really valuable? Is this what my life was going to be, or should I have, as my mother wanted, Dr. Mulvaney on my door? Uh, came up here for graduate school in food science. Spent a year here. It was engaging but not fulfilling. But in the year that I spent here, what I, happened was I fell in love with Sacramento and the 12-month growing season and everything coming out of the ground all the time. There's always something different. And the fact that I got to meet farmers, that I got to know who grew apples, oranges, rice, squashes, the only person that grows on Dive in America. At the end of the year, at the end of that first year, Madeline said, come down and teach. And I went back to Napa Valley, and I was Madeline's assistant for the summer. At that point, it was probably 2,500 people applying for the 40 slots. Every two weeks, four different chefs coming in, creating their own curriculum. And as I looked at it and meeting the winemakers and the people who were down there, I realized that food is valuable and food is a good life. And and this is a noble way, if you will, to spend your life. And that's when I called my advisor and said I wasn't coming back. But knew that Sacramento was my home mm. and that this is where I was going to be. And so driving back at the end of my summer in Napa, if you remember the movie It's a Wonderful Life, Jimmy Stewart wants to get out of the small town his whole life. And at the end of the movie, he realizes the small town is really where he should have been the whole time and should stay. He runs down the street and yells, hello, uh, Merry Christmas, you wonderful building and loan. So driving back up from Napa, I knew not only that this was going to be my home and where I was going to establish myself, but that when I opened a restaurant, I would have Mulvaney's building and loan. I oh, love it. Uh, so now you, at this point, like you knew that it was going to happen. Like this, You're going to mm-hmm. make this restaurant, your, your dream come to fruition. How were you living intentionally to make it happen? Take us like what your, your your plan of action was to make this dream come true. So it was it was working to figure out how to how to finance what it looked like, what, how to be involved in the community in a way that was functional. And I don't know that it was necessarily as intentional as you might think, right? When I when I came back here in 1995, the restaurant I worked at, I think they had an over under um, an over under pool on me as to whether I was going to live past 35. <laughs> and uh, at the at the same restaurant, I walked in. So you know, Kaczynski, the the Unabomber, got arrested here in Sacramento. And the day he was arrested, I walked into the restaurant, and everybody stood up and applauded because they thought it was me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so wait, what, what what kind of reputation did you have? I'm just curious. Like, were you like a ba- the bad boy, the the partier? And I was just, I, I think that I was just this weird guy. Like, who is this guy who's a little bit older than most of your regular cooks? And he says he's going to open a restaurant, but is he really? Is he, he's not polished for sure, but what he is is a good teacher, right? And so in those years, what I did was really hone that idea of how to reach out to teach the people who are working for me, but also to teach uh, customers, right, and to and engage them. So at that particular restaurant, Paragary's at the time on Sunday nights, people would say, just like Madeline's school, right, hey, I want to learn this from you. So they would come in and say, I want to learn what's a Reichstoffel. I never made that good Sunday night. You're going to come in two hours early, and I'm going to get all the ingredients for you, and you and I are going to talk about what Indonesian cuisine looks like. And that was cooks. Sometimes that was waiters. That was busboys, anybody who wanted. And then what happened was that our family meal on Sundays 
which was just for us in the kitchen, started to get populated by six or eight people sitting at the bar, just coming in. They're like, hey, we don't know what for family meal is tonight, but this is what we're going to do. And, and again, it's two things. One, we're teaching people, but also that we're sharing and we're bringing community together. So today at the BNL, every fourth Monday, we have family meals. We'll bring 160 people next door during the summer. On Monday, we had 40 people sitting outside to say, you're eating four courses, you're sitting with people you may not know, and you're celebrating food. So Monday's, Monday's dinner was all about the potato, right? So we had a uh, Niswa salad with binchy potatoes, and we had uh, mountain rose dumplings for the second course. And then we made um, pom boulanger, but because we were using chicken that we had marinated in yogurt and uh, dried yeast to give it that, ye- that uh, red color from tandoori, uh, we changed those potatoes up to add mustard seed and turmeric and ginger mm. in with the onions and butter just to give it a little little Asian flavor as well. And the people who come are super engaged at the idea of everybody knows now that you don't ask before Thursday what dinner is on Monday, right? <laughs> even though it's know, a... Yeah. <laughs> so the only one we know is the next one, which is Thanksgiving, and that's um, spaghetti carbonara mm. because Calvin Trillin says that that should be the national dish of uh, Thanksgiving. <laughs> And deep fried turkey with all the fixings. One thing I'm picking up from you that's <coughs> really evident is that you you know the value of community involvement in education. Uh, where did this come from, and what can we learn from you, and how to do that right? Well, I think you know my my grandmother was a teacher, and that's what made my mom become an educator as well, for sure. Um, I saw the value from my father of being gregarious, right? So so a lot of people call me chef, right? And even before because I can't remember names. So I call everyone chef. My dad was a lawyer. We'd walk down the street in Queens Boulevard. He'd say, counselor, good morning. Counselor, good morning. When I was a kid, pop, who's that? I don't know. Who's that? I don't know. <laughs> well, how do you know they're a lawyer? Because they're wearing a cheap suit and it's not new. <laughs> and so it became clear that that idea of recognizing people was important, right? And and valuing them as they, as they, they come along. And then for my mother, that's the idea of education, right? And the idea that, you know, Dan Tuberty, my first boss, says, we are teachers, at the end of the day, that that the truth is that Dave Burke was showing me how to be a leader and let leader with chaos going on underneath you, but controlling as you can that chaos. Roxanne was teaching me how to look out to the world and take things from unlikely places and put them together in new and unique ways. Madeline was teaching me the value of intellectual discipline, right? Tough, tough, right? Making sure that you're there. And then the people here in Sacramento, you know, Sacramento is a place I say where, um, you know, I came here and didn't know anybody, zero. And five years after the restaurant opened, we were recognized as the small business of the year. Sacramento is a place where if you put your sneakers on and jump on the field, people look at you and say, you want to play? Let's go. Yeah. Right. And so that, that embrace by the community is very important. And that's kind of what we want to share with the other people, right, with other cooks. So when you see Brad Checky uh, moving on, we see Kimio, we see the other people, Billy Zolan, who have worked for me and gone on to open their own places, that, that that's an important part, right? And an important part now for me is not teaching, but teaching the teachers to teach the other people so yes. they can teach the teachers. Yes, it's so important. And, and um, I mean, what can we learn? Like, what advice do you have? Uh, I mean, how, how do you teach? Give us, like, do you have a process? Or <laughs> they, I, maybe that's is too broad of a question, but, like, what do we need to know ab- about teaching and how can we teach better? So I think the, the key for the teaching is that you have to share excitement, mm. right? That you need to be engaged actively in what it is that you're teaching. So if you're just talking at somebody, you know, my wife will tell me, that I'm good at banging someone's head over and over again, you know? And she said that, honey, that doesn't go anywhere. But if you can get them engaged and say, hey, this is cool and this is why, and this is what I want you to do, then those people are going to go. So be mindful of your energy. Like when you're teaching, are you enthusiastic about it? Because if you're just going through the motions, it's going to go one through one ear out the other. And but is and is what you're teaching something that they're receiving, right? Mm. So So the act of teaching is not, is not as much standing up at the lectern, lecturing to 200 people, but looking in their eyes to see whether it's going in and whether it's being received. And then following up in here in a kitchen, following up to see if what they're doing came out right, and then to see if they're taking what, you, what you've what you started and making it better, mm-hmm. right? 
So, so the other, so the teaching is seeing if there's engagement, seeing if they're following through and what your instructions and coaching have led to. And then perhaps the most important piece is then to see, and this is difficult, if they're, if they're then grasping that and going forward on their own, mm. right? Like how do, you get, how do you get the kids to be not with training wheels? Yeah, and I think that's really important. And that's, that is really the secret sauce, the it factor of humanity, right? Our ability to take what's been given to us, right, and to compound off of it and to go into the future with it. And now that we know this, now we have tools at our disposal like podcasts and other mm-hmm. recently the internet to, to transfer this knowledge and these ideas. It's happening. It's compounding. It's happening faster than ever. But I think it's important that we embrace it. I think some people are, are afraid of the, the fact that their hard-earned knowledge is so accessible. But why is that the wrong mentality to have? But you could also, but you need to be, as you're embracing knowledge, you also need to be open to the idea that you don't necessarily know things, right? Yeah. So the was, more you know, the more you realize you don't know. <laughs> so I was talking to, have, yeah. you know, my buddy Tavel in in Austin. It's it's a super DIY place, and it's really cool. And ama- and we were cooking together somewhere, and I said, "Hey, when you're uh, nixtamalizing your corn for for masa, do you use uh, ashes or are you using just?" bagged lime because i haven't always had the greatest success with bagged lime he said i use bagged lime like oh mr diy big shot whatever you know (laughs) and one of the other guys who was cooking as a chef is uh navajo and so we yelled over like hey mark how do you make how do you make lye water out of ashes right you know how does that work and mark said i'm not really sure because my grandmother always just used maseka but she would put juniper ash into the tamal mix to make it taste like she remembered from her childhood, and that's why I do that. So then all three of us individually went back to Utah and Texas and California and started making our own lye water to see how it worked, right, and started sharing nice. among each other how that was working, which is great. So now we use it to nixtamalize our corn. We also actually, as it turns out, use it to make ramen, right, because ramen are alkali noodles, and we use that alkali water to raise the thing. And then because we're in a 120-year-old firehouse, it's great to pour it down the drain to clean out all the grease in the, in the pipes. <laughs> nice. So what's the lesson there to, to lean into collaboration, to, that there's more value in sharing knowledge than there is in keeping it to yourself? The lesson there is that it's okay to say, to stand up and say, I don't know. Mm. Right? If you want to be dramatic, to say, I'm naked I, I, and I'm not sure. Yeah. Right? It's hard to express vulnerability. And we talk about this a lot, right? And especially with the, the mental health stuff. Yeah. When they say... How do you make your making yourself vulnerable is so brave? But it doesn't occur to me that it, it's not an act to me of bravery, but an act of acknowledgement, right? That this is how I don't know and I want to know. And if I don't tell you that I don't know something, then I'm never going to get better. Yeah. And it's through that vulnerability, paradoxically perhaps, that you gain strength. Yeah, because and then, trust. Because then the people who are working for you say, shit, chef didn't know that. Wow, that was weird. I would never go out and say that, right? But look what he did. Okay, good. I'm gonna I'm gonna give him. I'm gonna step on board. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm ready to go on the pirate ship. Yeah. And, and there's something that happens when you roll over and expose your weaknesses and your vulnerability that it, it, it expedites. It speeds up the the level of trust between you and other people because they show they see that you have nothing to hide. Right. And that that humility is a very powerful thing if you when you know how to wield it the right way. Um, we haven't really gotten into an uh something I want to get into. We're, we'll leave time to talk about the the impact you're happening or you're you're having on uh creating awareness about mental health in your community. I mm-hmm. think that's really important, but take us through real quick give us some like business nuggets about how you how you developed how you got the money for your business any advice on building out a restaurant um anything like that that we haven't touched on yet that comes to mind that you can share with us sure so i've been working around getting closer i'd saved some money not enough uh (laughs) to open a restaurant came to the point where it was clear it was time Mm. right for me to. how do you know it was time um the restaurant I was working at had some bad things happen, and it was time for me to gotcha. leave. I stood up, and uh, and uh, the management left, and the matter had been resolved. And uh, here we are. But then anyway, here I was, free, right? And then started to look and say, it's time, right? What am I going to do? How much does the restaurant cost? How do I find the money? Really, seriously, right? For the first time, to be intentional about it. Um like knowing and what you know now, reflecting back at this time, was there, there things that you wish you had known going through the motion? Things you had to find out the hard way that you can share with us? The <laughs> yeah, tons. <laughs> I think that I think that uh, that yes, the first thing I would say the the important piece is do the homework and read the fine print and make sure that you look through everything so that it's not and and it's not 
um, rude to say, I just want to be clear, right? To set clear boundaries and understandings before to, in legal paperwork or with anything, right? As you're going forward. Talking about partnerships or, or so we have leasing contracts. So, so I've been blessed not to, and cursed not to have partners because while it's great that I don't have partners and it's just my wife and I, it's also a curse in that I don't have the needed discipline because I don't have to report to anybody else, mm -hmm. right? I mean, except for my wife. Um, so we finished, and I was I was close, and I looked at looking at restaurants, operating restaurants to buy, uh, how much that cost, how much it costs to find a space and build out a restaurant, and then the third option was an ongoing catering company, and how much of that, how much would that cost? Turns out the most cost effective, or for us, the lowest price was that was that catering piece. Mm -hmm. I asked a friend who I had worked with at another catering company. I said, "Hey, I'm thinking about this." catering thing instead of opening a restaurant what do you think she said yeah you're full of shit so you're good with the catering you know how to do the talking but here's what i'll tell you you need to be done in seven years do, what, okay um, catering catering has a life cycle of okay. seven years and and didn't didn't think about it too much at the time but it's true why because right? in 2000 because you enter into a small catering company where you're driving mm -hmm. around in your truck and bringing things to people's houses and going forward, and it's you. It's the personality that goes on. Mm -hmm. And then in 2006, the restaurant opened, and then the restaurant took more of my attention, and I wasn't paying that much attention to the catering. Maybe the catering wasn't as good as it could have been because I was looking at other stuff, and my interest is here in the restaurant, having people in the seats. And also, it's hard work, mm -hmm. and you just get beat up, right? By the end of seven years, you're done. And I've seen that with others, so I knew... That happened at the kitchen with those guys here in town. I've seen it with other caterers who have come after me who I've said, who to whom I've said, you have seven years. Yeah. Right? I wasn't smart enough to get out after seven years. So you weren't, so what happened because you didn't get out after seven years? Because uh, I was chicken and the catering wasn't as good as it could have been. And then because I wasn't paying attention, then it going, it went from a money maker to just being neutral or not making money. Okay. Right? And so it, it was the financial piece became, the financial picture was less rosy, but to me as important is the satisfaction piece became less important. Sa whose satisfaction? Both mine, mine mostly I think, and then some of the customers, right? I knew, I knew that I wasn't doing the best I could. Mm. So right? when did you know it was time to, are you still doing catering to this day? So you? right now, so here's what, here's what we did in 2008, our uh, neighbor next door in the auto body shop said he was done and wanted to sell the spot and we went and played rock paper scissors on a price <laughs> and uh we bought we bought that space so it has 40 people in the small room 150 in the big room um we signed he worked on cars on tuesday we signed papers on thursday and saturday we had our first party nice um and that's been great right because now that brings it all back to one space and i guess that's a, a nugget is you have to think about what are your strengths and your capabilities so i know that if I'm in one place, then I'm more likely to be able to pay attention mm -hmm. to what's actually going on. So having everything here is super important. You know, we did a little thing at the museum, the art museum in town for a while, and that was separate, right? And the catering that was offsite was separate, and being in the Golden One Arena yeah. was separate. And because they were separate, I'm good. I'm good if there's a home base, right? Got you. Like that other stuff is hard. I think the big lessons I'm pulling from you, um, when you're getting started, I think a lot of people shoot for the restaurant on day one, but know that you can scale into it. And the way that you wanted to scale into it, the way you decided to scale into it was with starting with, with the catering. Um, so the scale into the catering had two things in it. One, it was less expensive, right? Exactly. And at that point, I, you know, I had some money, but not enough and needed some more. Um, so lower entry. And lower entry fee, right? And with the idea flow, that right? we could that we could buy a company and pay them based on on our sales the more the person who owned the company helped me to sell the more money that they would make it would incentivize them to move forward but we still needed a little bit of money for the down payment and i asked my father and he said no i said well pop this is what i'm gonna do and he said fuck you i'm not putting any money in i said okay and i didn't talk to him and two weeks later he called and he said what are you doing he said i'm opening a catering company so you don't have any fucking money i said yeah i do he said where'd you find the money i said i got it on the street i'm paying a point and a half a month and it's got to go back in cash, and there's all sorts of challenges with it, but this is going to enable me to have my own business and move forward and buy a restaurant. And so then he called back in two days after that and said, okay, I found you this money at the bank. 
and he probably got it at six and charged me 12, right? <laughs> and, um, but we started moving on, right? And so a great day, you know, three years later when I finally got to give him his check, his final check, and give him all his money back. But the idea that we started off small, it's like making a caramel, right? Yeah. And you make caramel, you have sugar in there, and it's just that little piece in the middle that starts to brown, and then you make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And so as we did the same with catering, making that brown spot bigger and bigger, some of it went back to pay off debts. And most of it, though, went to building forward for the future of the restaurant, to be able to say, to come here in 2004 and say, this is what I see, and let's do everything with a conscious mind towards building a restaurant. Yeah. And then for us, I'm a shanty Irish guy, so like not having shame, but inviting people in and just saying, so for me, it's always been about, hey, this is who we are, right? And so we started with chairs that we got out of a leftover Starbucks somewhere, and there was a big card table card table my wife hates me saying this with a dirty green tablecloth she insists the tablecloth was clean with a bar <laughs> on it and my dad sitting behind the bar pouring 23 ounces of wine into glasses and saying, Bob, you're killing me saying, i don't want to be cheap it's your money I'm like no well okay um but for us and for us i think that's the other and the important nugget is to engage your customers engage yeah. your community to i think the other thing your like you weren't going like you were just trying to be complete you weren't going for the most expensive things be, being modest right. early on and just in starting where you can right and knowing mm -hmm. that like and you say you're putting money away you're you had the the, the wherewithal the, to know that i need to put a little first get rid of the debt and then put put stuff away and so now start investing the back exactly. into, into the business yeah and for us a great a great gift was that because for four years five years that we were catering those weddings that we did those uh birthdays those important pieces when we opened the restaurant because those had been so well received, because they were so memorable to people. That's your baseline. That's your, boom, your yeah. Right. So probably to this day, about at least one third of the people whose weddings we have catered come to celebrate their anniversary. It's all about relationships. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's 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 the those the relationships we have with our guests that are going to make them choose you over other people. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I I see that you see that the value in that, and I want to bring that to the surface. I can't bring it to the surface enough. Any other key lessons you can drop on us? I I want to make sure we, we we talk about what you've uncovered it with your um, pay your taxes <laughs> and pay attention to the ABC. I right? pay attention to the pay attention to the to the booze man right because those are the, those are the ones that are going to come and get you is that what do you mean with the abc the booze, booze? here and it's the alcohol and beverage control oh, in the state you, gotcha. of california okay and and so but what that means is that that stuff is hard right and and if your payments to abc or to the the tax here in california the board of equalization are only due every three months then sometimes it's easy to say oh i have that money mm -hmm. but it's super important to make sure that that money is going away Right? Yeah, in a specific yep. way, so that you're up to date and paying them on time. Yeah, okay. So, I think it's good to to we can transition to what you th I think you do really well. What we can learn from you is you're not only I mean you you've shown your value towards relationships, but beyond that, you advocate. Uh, take us into why it's so important, why you stand up and, and speak on behalf of your communities and and educate beyond just food and, and restaurants, but in like I guess wellness. Well, it's our community, right? And how does our how does our community get better? So last year. Started the year with uh, four people dying by suicide. Our friend Noah Zonka, who's a beloved chef in town, probably in March after these four suicides, I'd written a note to his mom to say, and she lets us tell this story, to say, where is Noah? We haven't seen him, and we're worried about him. Hoping that she was going to say, he's with me, he's getting help, we're going to see him someday soon. The note I got back was, we don't know. We think he's living on the river, and we're not really sure. And if you see him, tell him that I love him, mm. and I'll do the same for you. So in May, we got a note back from his mom saying that he had been found. Man. And, yeah, it was heartbreaking, right? And during this time, we, as restaurateurs and chefs, have been talking about what's our responsibility in all this, right? Like, how did we let Noah get away? Like, there's this thing, right, with hospitality where you're always facing happy man out in the public, right? And even when we said to Noah, no, dude, I'm your friend, right? You're, I want to help and couldn't get through. Like, how the fuck do we get through, and how do we prevent it from happening to other people? So Noah's not the only one, right? There were other people. Mm. And so we had civic-minded people because we're in a restaurant, and I talk to people all the time, then, then health organizations and construction organizations, people have been talking about issues of homelessness and mental health in Sacramento, said, how can we help? We want to figure out how to help you. 
And so we had a meeting scheduled on a Tuesday the week before. Like I said, I was going back to James Beard for the boot camp. They'd asked me to talk about food policy and, and farming. I was getting on the plane that day. My wife called and Bob and said, poor Dane's dead. Mm. And so no place better than to spend in a farm out in upstate New York with 14 or 15 other chefs talking about how important he was in our lives, right? And I guess I didn't, you know, cut off from the outside world. I didn't realize maybe what the impact was, but I knew that he was important to us because, yeah, he talked about, yeah, we're rebels or the, here's all the dirty stuff. But to me, he was the first person who said, what you do is valuable. What you do is important. What you do is needed. When his book came out, 14 Cooks in My Kitchen all read the book. First book that any of them had ever purchased voluntarily. First book that many of them had ever read. Super important to say, here's what you do, and here's what's important. So we came back on Tuesday, and we had a meeting with a bunch of business people. Some of them started to say, this is great. Let's have a meeting. Let's talk. Let's and uh, Jonathan runs the largest crisis line in California, and he said, Chef says the tribe wants to move fast and it doesn't mind failing. Let's go. How long? And I said, Monday. I can have 15 people here. So 10 days after Bourdain's death, we had 15 people, chefs and restaurateurs, sitting around the table with the leading minds of mental health in, in Sacramento, telling us what mental health is, starting us on that path to say, how, here's how you can help. And we came out of the day with three things. Important for us to talk about it as leaders, Important for us to provide peer support, right? Because they're not going to tell me that they're on a toot. They're not going to tell me that they're depressed or, or hanging out because I'm the chef. How do we do it? But they're going to talk to Dan, the bartender, or Yana, the doula, and those other people. And then third, is there stuff online, right? Because the problem was that through the years before this, all we knew, we knew that what we had to say when people were having tough times was inappropriate, right? Go home. Get back on the line. Stop drinking. Do a shot, right? None of those, none of those went to the heat of the heart of the matter, and so we came out of that and started talking about it. There was a conference in town that came with 150 healthcare workers who said um, their organizer said to us, "You are the fucking problem." My goal in this conference has been for them to leave a scar on the city of Sacramento, and the scar they're going to leave is improved mental health care for hospitality. And so over three days, long conference they were diligent in their work and came up with a program that we call like at your back which is peer and near peer support and counseling so that every day on in on our floor and now we've piloted this in 15 other restaurants in sacramento someone who on the floor has a pin and right, uh, that has a purple hand on it so that you know that they are open and eligible and able to refer you to mental health resources if you're having a tough time they're also empowered by us as leadership and owners to talk to folks that they may think are having problems and there's the website online it has resources which are good for sure not perfect right now but here's what i love about it it's that when you open the website i got your back dot info what comes out on top is a banner that says in the weeds get help and gives you a crisis line and importantly to your point a text crisis line for people to be able to say hey here's help and so f over the last few months, we put that, I think maybe three quarters or more of the people that work here have those numbers in their pocket on their phone mm. all the time. But we pull people in the back and say, hey, I'm not going to be with you all the time. But here, here, you want to try this? Give me your phone. Here's, here's, we can do a demo. I can talk to them. We can talk to them together. You can talk to them yourself. But then in the end, when I give them back the phone, you get to say, save that. Call it coffee. Call it espresso. Call it smoked salmon. I don't care so that other people don't necessarily know that you're facing challenges because that's the hard part. Mm. But I know and you know that if you're in a place where you need help, that on the other end of this phone, there's someone there who's professional who can get you from hot and challenged to resources and help. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm loving what you're sharing with us. Uh, I want to dissect it a little bit more. Uh, the, the, f the three things, uh, talk about it, peers, uh, and that last one was that was it get on what was the last one Sh the the that there's an online presence right get online it was at the the, con like the and that's the I got your back dot info and so what happened there is so we started so October was the conference and we started sharing right with all you know just as you do right you would talk about it with restaurant tours and what would happen then is like every week two weeks or sometimes more people chefs would call me chef I got someone in my office here's the deal they're talking about suicide, they're strung out, they are, here's a problem, what do I do? And I would connect them to resources manually, 
right? If you would be able to say, here you go, call this person. Here's a, here's a mental health person. Here's this person. This is the get online. This is before the okay. online, before the website was there. I was doing it all individually. So I was in Toronto in April, and the website had come online that morning. I was at a Blue Jays game. Phone rings. Pick it up. Fuck. Hey, chef, how you doing? All right, what's going on? I got I got a cook, and she's she's not doing well. She's, she's talking about suicide. All right. She talked about suicide. Does she have means? Um, does she have a plan? No, she doesn't have a plan. And she's at work. She's on a two-man station, so she's with someone else, and she's doing pretty good. Good where you're at. I'm at my desk. Cool. Kick up the website. Let's pretend that you didn't get me on the phone and see whether there's resources. And then he got to stroll, scroll through and say, okay, she has this kind of insurance so i can call that or i'm not sure if she has that kind of insurance gotcha, i can call gotcha. these people so basically you're just you're training people to know where to go to get the mm -hmm. resources so again uh you know talk about it peers and then get online where the, the resources are i want to pull back the layers on, and talk about it because i think it might be if awkward for a lot of people that see somebody who clearly might be or sometimes we don't even know um but, but how do you engage that person in a way to get them to talk about it or do they have to come out to you initially and say something like where like how do you get the ball moving on this like, how do you approach that conversation so when we finished when we finished our conference my wife was brilliant and she said this is important and we do a lot of cool shit right we get to travel around we get to cook and but we don't always tell the kids the boys and girls right that work for us we don't always share that with them this is important and we need to share it and make it a part of our everyday conversation and so she went she came back and she took a tea box and put four colors of construction paper with faces on it for happy, neutral, angry, and in the weeds, mm. different colors. And then we put it in next to the POS system. When you checked in in the morning, a couple of times a month, we'll just say, hey, taking a temperature check. Here you go. How is everybody? And then at lineup that night, here's where we're at. Most people are happy. Three people are neutral. Two people are angry, but we know that one of them's you, so that's fine. But hey, today there's three blues. Three of us are having trouble. Mm. What are we going to do to make today successful for them and for our clients? And if you're one of the blues, what are you going to do? What can we do to help you? And what are you going to take from today so that next week when you're green, you're able to help those the blues next week more effectively? So the, the first step, it sounds like, is to create the open up the channel of communication in a way that's very as easy as just dropping a, a piece of paper in a box. And totally, totally anonymous. And, and everybody, I was surprised at how seriously everybody took it. But the first thing that you have to do is make it okay not to be okay. And the point of what happened was that we were then creating a space for conversation. So that was it, right? That's the conversation. That's it. Three blues, what are we doing? Good luck, everybody. But then you're folding napkins, you're picking herbs, you're pulling out mats, you're making stock at the end of the night. Then you've already opened up that conversation so that everybody started talking talking about it. And, I, and, I, and it's changed the culture of the restaurant. And I wouldn't... At first, I couldn't say that, right, because I'm in the yeah. center and it's hard to look at. But we had, so we ended our year on, on a down note, right? We had four suicides. Uh, four people died by suicide in uh, Christmas. And in, in Sacramento. In Sacramento, right? Not so, with your, your so well, uh, best man at a bartender's wedding, two former employees, and then a server who was mm. with us died by suicide on Christmas. And her family, again, her family lets us tell this story because it's important. And when I brought everyone back together to talk about her passing after the break, and I, I don't know what to talk about. This is hard, right? Like you said, how do you get in? How do you yeah. know? But what I saw was all our staff using the tools and techniques and methods and things we had been talking about to engage with each other and themselves. Mm. So you could say, hey, you need to take the day off? Good. We're fine. You need to go out and have a smoke. That's fine. You need to cut onions so it looks like you're crying and no one knows. That's good. You want to go on the walk-in for three minutes? Pff, no problem, right? But everybody reached out, and it was that sense. It strikes me that that sense that we had created a space where it was okay to talk about challenges that you were having in your mental health life, right, that then become easier. And as now as we progress, people will call and say, having a tough day, can't do it today. No yeah. problem, right? And and it's also good as a restaurateur, as a, as a tip, because then you're engaging with your employees in a different way. So instead of go home, get back on the line, stop drinking or drink more, you're saying before it gets to that crisis point, hey, what's going on? I notice you're not performing. I notice you're having a tough time. How can we help you? Here's resources we have. This is what I think you should see. Here's what we can do. And so now you're getting to a place where there's more 
support for them. They feel they're being heard. It doesn't work all the time. But a lot of times what happens is eventually some people will come and say, yep, I want help. I'm ready. Sometimes they don't, right? And that's fine. Yeah, I, th- I think too. we've I, – I, th- I thank you for getting into that. I think we've – at least I better understand what you mean by talk about it. Essentially creating that culture and creating the channels of communication so people can let you know that there is something wrong. And then th- also put working into your culture that it's okay to talk about it thereafter. I think that kind of works into the peers – Right. Chap, right, and so it's the and it and it's that peer support piece, and then for me, the chefs from around the country reaching out to say, "How do you do this? How do you start?" Yeah. Right. So when we started our pilot, eleven Tony Romas in Pensacola, Florida, said, "We're going to do this program." Right? And some of the people were like, "We don't actually know it's a program yet," but I was like, <laughs> "Fuck, here you go. Right, yeah. this is what we're doing, and please tell us, tell us how it's going." Right. Hey, how do I how do I make sure that that's okay? And just the idea for me. If you can, the goal is to reduce stigma and increase conversation to improve outcomes. Yeah. Right. And that's it. So by for us to be able to share, right, to be able to say, yes, I've been depressed. I mean, everybody saw how, how I was after Noah died, but also that I've had depression, right, that I see a psychologist. That's okay. And, and it changed the way we work in the restaurant. And then, and then what it means is that people from the outside, customers now are coming in to say, Hey, I got to tell you about my workplace, my this, my that. This woman three weeks ago came in and said, my uncle was 81 and he died by suicide. And I was all twisted and didn't know what was going on. I got on a plane and I grabbed a magazine. And in that magazine was an article about the work you're doing. I can't tell you how much that's helped. Mm. So that now, like, fuck, we're helping other, we're helping ourselves for sure. And that's going to be the focus. We're also helping others, right, that are, Bartender that the the woman whose whose best man in her wedding died by suicide in December. There was a woman at the at the chef's table sitting there who was having just a tough time, and all of a sudden Adrian knew, right? Hey, let's talk about it. Hey, it's okay to feel that way. Hey, do you need help? Hey, this is, and she came to me and said, Hey, chef, you know what? It's like I got your back, right? I'm actually using it, like all the help and the support that I've gotten from the restaurant and the people who have been so good to me here. I'm giving back. Yeah, yeah. And it's that giving back, right? We know that it's the, for us in hospitality, right? What do we do? We make people happy, right? So there's two things there. One, here's a way to give back that we didn't think about before. And two, maybe it's thinking about, we always say, is your water cold? How's the smoked salmon? Is your coffee hot? Did you like your steak? But we never turn it on ourselves. How am I doing? Mm. And so for the first time, this is us saying, hey, let's turn, let's turn our strengths, right? Which are, hospitality pleasing people make sure we're checking in to ourselves and that makes us more effective yeah you, as we go back you can't out into serve the world. other people until you are in a good place the, the better place you're in the better you're able to serve others we have to check in with ourselves yep absolutely so again those those three things are talk about it uh bring it to your peers create a peer-to-peer uh support and then get online get access to the tools and resources and where exactly are we going online i don't think you so mentioned the website i got your back dot info okay. and it's and it's the idea is that spreading the message that it's okay not to be okay. And and if we can reduce the stigma and increase the conversation wherever it is, at the end of the day, we're going to improve the outcomes. And that was a get your, get, get your I, back. I got your back dot info. I got your back dot info. I'll be sure to link to that in the show notes. This is episode 670. Three. So head over to restaurantstoppable.com such six seven three, and we'll be sure to link to, to that for you. Uh, I'm just curious. Have you? I feel like we know that suicide has reached an all time high, uh, not just within the restaurant industry, but mm-hmm. across all across society. Why do you think that is? What, what's going on in society where suicide is so high? I think that we're that we're pulled out, right? And and I think that you know if if Bourdain said that we were all misfits and said uh, said you know. We are on a pirate ship. If, it, if there's one thing that bugs me a little is that uh, as we start talking about this stuff, I find out that people in restaurants aren't misfits, right? That we're just the same as everyone else. But the truth is we just don't share our stories, mm. right? And if and and so it appears to me a couple of things that why restaurants first. One is that we share stories, that we put our, we put our hearts on our plates. So we, we are open to sharing all the time. And we talk to everybody. Right, everyone from the garbage man to the governor eats in my restaurant, and so if you're if they see you having that conversation, then that starts to spread out, mm-hmm. spread out across, and the support and how much it's resonated has just been um, 
surprising, it's reaffirming, right? Not yeah. surprising, but 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 just good to see people saying, "How can I help?" Mm. So, what do you think it is about society today, though, that makes people more prone to suicide? How has society changed? Why why are suicide rates up? I'm just curious. To oh fuck, I don't know. I just I'm just trying not to burn the chicken <laughs> <Yeah>. stuff. <laughs> I was just curious to see if you had an opinion on that. But uh, I I love this conversation, man. You you shared a lot of great knowledge with us, and more impo- importantly, it's just been an honor to make an example of your values and who you are and what you're doing to make your community better. Uh, before we we go into the speed round, I want to ask, how have you transformed? Who who are you today versus the man you were when you got into this industry? Well, I'm a lot older, so my knees hurt more. Uh, less hair, maybe. Yeah, less hair, more chins. Um, no, I think I think sometimes sometimes I'm more thoughtful, but I think that I think that I've always looked at not anal- not really being comfortable in saying what I am because I know that w- much of what I'm doing is is theater, right? Mm. And and what what's the example I'm showing to other people, and and how are we doing now? I certainly hope that I'm getting better. Right, you know, I have a reputation in Sacramento of uh, and everywhere, I guess, of being a, a, an asshole and hard to work for. So I, th- I still think I'm hard to work for, but I might be more reasonable. I hope that I'm more reasonable than <laughs> I was uh, ten years ago. But certainly, you'd have to ask other people whether that is. But the point is that you want to be able to see what comes next, right? And so, when so I'm proud of the restaurant, and I'm proud of the work that everyone does here, but I'm also really proud of how my city has changed and how our food scene has changed with the people that have been through the restaurant participating And you in leading that. the way, being at that leading edge, really in- encouraging and influencing that that transformation. Uh, I'll say it yeah. uh, from what I've heard uh, of other people on your track record. So thank you for being at that leading edge. And We're back. And the first question I have for you is what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? Elvis is on the plate. Okay. What do you, <laughs> what do you mean by that? So we talk about we talk about the love, right? Yeah. When you put your love into the plate, so we say, "Is Elvis in the building?" Uh, so on every time you do something, it's it's got to be special and it's got to be heartfelt and it's got to be important. I love it. What is your biggest weakness? Uh, patience. How are you overcoming that? Practicing patience. <laughs> <laughs> what is one question you ask or thing you look for during the interview process? Cook an egg, cut an onion, saute a piece of fish. What are you looking for? Hands. Right, so what I'm looking for is to see how your hands work in the kitchen. What is your biggest challenge today? Uh, business climate moving forward, hard, hard to hard to operate uh, and to make a profit at the same time that you're making people happy and providing meaningful employment for 45 people here. How are you overcoming that? Uh, not as well as I'd like, <laughs> but but you know what? It's a slug, and maybe it's it kind of goes back to Ireland, right? To say. Fuck! I'm not going to let them beat me, right? So it's that it's that determination, right? The mm. most important piece of uh, most important thing a, a restaurateur can have is a thick skull, so you can keep pushing on those uh, <laughs> doors that are in front of you. What is one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team? This is a way to be, a way to act, a core value. Welcome. Mm. First word you hear when you come in the restaurant. I love it. What is one way you, your team goes above and beyond what's expected from the guest? So. Uh, Something that's common within your four walls, but it's not common in the industry when it comes to service. Well, I don't know what's not common, right, in other places, but I know that what what is common here, and that what people tell me that they love, especially, is that when they come here, they feel like family. They feel like they're a part of, and they feel engaged and coddled. That wow. we respond to desires, known and unknown. What's one book that will make us a better person or restaurant operator? If you're a cook on food and cooking, Harold McGee, the world's best bathroom book, five-minute vignettes. <laughs> uh, what's the biggest lesson from that book? Um, so the biggest lesson from that book is is how to do something and how to – how the biggest lesson from that book is I have a question and how can I get closer to the answer. The other book that I would say is Danny Meyer right, and Service and the story about the guy from Spark Steakhouse who puts the candle in the middle of the table and moves it and says, move it, where's the center of the table? That's your job. And we're, That's your job. So your job is to make sure that everything yeah. is the same every night and to do it with grace and kindness so that your people are yeah. motivated to do it And themselves. just accept that it's your job and don't lose your shit when you've done it a million times and you're <laughs> still right. doing it because that's what, what your job is, to put yep. it back in the center, to show what that standard is. Yep. I love it. Uh, what is one thing you feel restaurant tours don't do well enough or often enough? 
thank our staff because mm-hmm. those are the ones that, that keep us going and keep the doors open. What is one piece of technology you've recently adopted in your business that's had a huge impact on the communications, efficiency, profitability, anything along those lines? I'm kind of a Luddite, right? So I think that <laughs> I think that what, what I've adopted what I've adopted in terms of technology is uh, since our daughter is back, going to her and saying, "Here, you're 30. Fix this." <laughs> there you go. I have somebody on your team that is good with technology and yes. trust them to deal yes. with it. Right. Uh-huh. right. Uh, if you got the news, this is the last question, by the way. It's a doozy, so get ready for it. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants would be lost with your departure, with the exception of three pieces of wisdom, three things that you could leave behind for the good of humanity and for your legacy. What would those three things be if you'd only leave three behind? Lean in. Don't be afraid. Is that one or two? Uh, that's two. Okay. And then, and then, and the third one is learn to lead the parade confident that people are following behind you without looking over your shoulder lean in uh don't be afraid and learn to say it one more time learn to lead the parade confident that people are following behind you without looking over your shoulder i love it great stuff thank you so much patrick for taking the time to share your story your knowledge your mentorship uh we wrap up every chat by calling somebody out that's actually how i found you uh patricia weiss suggested i connect with you so who do you respect and admire and believe would make a great guest like you made for us today Santana Diaz, new chef at UC Davis Medical Center, which is an odd thing for a restaurateur, but here's what he's done. If we do things for farm to fork that are cool and we show off in our 70-seat restaurant, what's neat? He's moving markets and changing food because he's feeding 43,000 people a week, 43,000 meals a week. And so when we say we're farm to fork, we support small farmers. We're doing these things. He's doing it on a scale that's enabling farmers to make money Mm. and put their children to school and have employees because what we think about every day is sustainability and when we define sustainability as the farms the families and the workforce Mm. santana diaz look out i'm coming after you i'd love to get you on the show and how can we connect with you if uh we want to learn more about mental health or we have questions about how to handle a situation um that's in front of us or maybe we just want to come join your team and work for you what's the best way to connect so that's uh mulvaney's bl.com and uh, get us through there. We're at 1215 19th Street in Midtown, Sacramento. And you can find us on the website and uh, the I got your back, uh, dot info or on Instagram and uh, Facebook and Twitter. Beautiful. We're out there, too. And send us messages, and there's people who get back to you as soon as you can. And But if you're having a mental health crisis, then just go on the website and call that crisis line. doesn't matter how you feel. You can even do it for practice. Same thing with the with the text. And this is episode, again, 673. Head over to restaurantstoppable.com slash 673 for a summary of today's discussion. I'll link to any books or tools that are recommended and how to connect with Chef Patrick. And just, again, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story, your knowledge, your mentorship, and for uh, really being the leading edge and uh, helping us fix this problem with mental health in our, in our, in our industry and in the world really uh just thank you for all you do there is no questioning you are unstoppable thank you we'll thank get you. better cheers <laughs>